He is salvation. There's no other name. He is our faith. He's our shield of faith. way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said. He is the gospel. He is salvation. There's no other name. He is the shield of faith. We cannot be defeated. We cannot be overcome. Welcome to the Light of Truth. We are so grateful that you joined us today. I'm telling you, God is doing amazing things through this ministry, reaching people all over the country, and we're so thankful that you are one of them that has chosen to be a part of it. So um, enjoy yourself. Receive everything you have from the Lord. We'll be back with you in just a little bit. Everything that we do in communication with God is prayer. I mean, worship is prayer. Thanksgiving is prayer. Uh, when, when we're petitioning God, it's, it's always anything to do with communicating with God, it's prayer. And, and we're just going to define it a little bit this evening. Uh, and I'm not trying to exhaust the definition because I, I just, I'm not qualified. God would have to supernaturally show me something that I can't, it can't be found in study because it, even if I studied all the time about this, if I had spent 21 years studying it, I'd never have gotten to the end of all there is in the Scripture about prayer. But the simplicity of prayer is that it's a noun. The word is a noun. It is a solemn request for help or expression of thanks addressed to God or an object of worship. People prayed all kinds of things. But the only person we pray to is God Himself. The, there's various factions or parts of prayer, intercession being one of them. Intercession is the act of, of uh, intervening on behalf of another. Uh, petition can be lumped into that. But when we have a petition, then we, we, we're, we're asking God for something in particular. We've got something that we're bringing before the Lord. And, and, and we, we don't get off this. This is, this is a, something, Lord, we're asking you to do. And until you do it, we're just going to keep asking you and believing you to do it. Uh, supplication. The, the, the word supplication takes on a lot of different uh, direction in prayer. It's, it's the action of asking or even begging. There's times that we plead with God. If you've never pled with God, you've never really been backed into a bad corner. Trust me, if you get in a big enough corner or a small enough corner with a big enough adversary, you'll plead with God too. Supplication is the action of asking or begging for something earnestly or humbly. There, there's a lot of Hebrew words that are defined prayer. And if you'll just be patient with me, these are very important things that we're looking at. And, uh, and, and you may not think so even after we've finished looking at them. But, but if you'll just be patient, we're going somewhere. But it may require patience. There's another Hebrew word. I think it's a little easier to pronounce. Palal. Not palmal. Palal. <laughs> It's, do, they, do they even make those cigarettes anymore? Huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I was hoping nobody knew the answer. <laughs> ah, rare form tonight. It means to judge officially or mentally by extension to intercede. In other words, you see something that is wrong and you start asking God to fix it. It means to pray, to entreat, to make supplication, begging and pleading in all humility. In Genesis chapter 20, verse 17, it says, so Genesis or so Genesis. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed 
Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bear children. The, you remember Abraham had lied and said Sarah was his sister, which he really didn't lie. You know, people say that it's not really a lie, but it is because the intent of the purpose, the purpose of, of why he said the story was to get them to believe she wasn't his wife. Yeah, she was his half-sister, and I get all that, but, but he wasn't trying to, to expose the fact that she was his sister. He was, she, he was trying to cover up the fact that she was his wife. So Abimelech took her as a wife, and God shut up all the women's wounds. And, and here again, God is, is showing himself mighty. Uh, the ignorance is in the world. The scriptures are not written. And he's handling things, and he understands what the problem is. And Abraham prays for him, and God heals them. He interceded on behalf of Abimelech and his wives and maidservants. And you got to understand it's not that this type of prayer, this way of praying is any less serious, but maybe it is done with a little less passion than the word we first looked at. But it doesn't mean that God won't answer it. This is the kind of praying, and it doesn't mean it's without passion, because this is the kind of praying that Hannah was doing that we see in 1 Samuel chapter 1. The Bible says she was in bitterness of soul, and she prayed to the Lord, and her mouth moved, but no words came out. So you don't even have to, words are not important. And I know people's going to go, oh, yes, words are very important in prayer. Then how did God answer Hannah's prayer? Because she wasn't even mouthing words. She's just groaning in the spirit, travailing. No, no words, no sound being heard. I'm telling you, if we would just understand what prayer is really all about. And, and quit looking at each other. Let, let's just get the word and see what the word says about prayer. There's another Hebrew word. Here we go. Tephalol. This must be a tough mother-in-law. I don't know. Uh, again, intercession, supplication, and even in song. This can, this can be a song or a psalm or a poem in prayer. David did this a lot, right? David wrote many, many psalms. This word is found 77 times in the Old Testament. And I couldn't find a time that prayer to God was not taking place. So in, in, in these other words, even though the words can be used for prayer, often they're not used in prayer. About half the time is what I really discovered. I wasn't just counting. I wasn't going to do that. I, you know, I'm not smart enough to do it any other way than get a piece of paper and just start marking, you know, like we're voting. And I'm not, I just wasn't going to do it. I didn't think it was that important. But I couldn't find a single instance uh, of this word, tephalol, that, that it was not prayer to God. In Psalm 65, it says in verse 2, O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. Jonah was doing this in the belly of the fish in verse 7 of chapter 2, When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thy holy temple. There's still more Hebrew words. Uh, Athar. It means to burn incense in worship, i.e. to intercede, to entreat, to pray, prayer. This word is found 20 times in the Old Testament. And it seems to point to prayerful worship. In Isaiah chapter 19, verse 22, it says, And the Lord shall smite Egypt. He shall smite and heal it. And they shall return even to the Lord, and He shall be entreated of them and shall heal them. You say, those, are, those are Hebrew words for prayer. So let's get into some Greek words. These are in the New Testament. I can't pronounce it any better than I can the Hebrew. <laughs> Pros UK. Are you kidding me? 
You, you understand they don't even speak Greek anymore. You get that? It's not a it's not a language been used. In, can't, you can see why, right? It means earnestly pray. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 13, and Jesus said to them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. In the, the Strong's 1162, wow, the Asus means a petition, and that was what I was alluding to earlier. Uh, but the angel said in Luke chapter 1, verse 13, But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. In Romans chapter 10, verse 1, we see the same word. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So we see a prayer, a petition that has been going up that is repeated, right? I mean, this is something that what Paul wanted for Israel was them to be saved. What Zechariah wanted was a boy. Right. Give me a son, Lord. How long had been, he had been praying? It probably a long time. He was an old man. How long had, had Paul been praying for uh, Israel to be saved? As long as he had been saved. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Do you have petitions? Yes. I mean, are there things that you, you've asked God for, you haven't seen it, but that petition's not going to change. Right. Come on. very well be something that we bring before the Lord again and again. And, and depending on where you fall on that, you know, I, I don't get tore up over it. Some people said you only have to ask once from then on you thank Him. I don't, you know, if that's what you want to do, that's fine. Uh, but obviously God is not opposed to people continually knocking. Because He said to knock and to keep knocking. That's what He said. He said there was an unjust judge and a widow and this widow just kept bringing her petition to the unjust judge. And Jesus said, that's how you ought to pray. You know, I, I, I think, just my humble opinion, I think we ought to pay more attention to what Jesus says than what anybody else says. Especially if they're still alive. And writing books and selling them and making money off you. We need to move on. You wonder why I'm so popular. <laughs> UK, UK, I guess. It means a wish, a wish. Anything that you wish for. I'm telling you, God will give you wishes. Yes, He will. He has me. I, things that I never thought I'd see. Things that I never dreamed possible. He is a good father. Yes, sir. It's a wish expressed as a petition to God. And this is something that I do not understand. I'm, I'm, I'll be totally... And I'm not 100% sure that Strong's got this right. That, you know, Strong's is a book... Written by men, you get this. I don't. I don't have a Hebrew dictionary or Greek dictionary in my brain. So if I want to find some of the meanings of these words, I got to depend on what people said, and I'm not sure they're right all the time. But I just got to do the best I can do with what I have, right? So I don't think anybody's right all the time. I know I'm not, but I'm not anything, but I just know that I'm not right all the time, and I just am strongly suspicious that no one else is either. But in the book of James, we see this, and this word is only in the New Testament three times. It's translated prayer one time, and it's translated vow twice. And I don't understand a vow completely. 
I know there's the Nazarite vow as far as what we understand about it. You know, we see Paul engaging in it in Acts, the 18th chapter. He shaves his head. He, he takes a vow that he's not going to drink uh, fruit of the, uh, of the grape or fruit of the vine. And, and he's doing that because these, these the, the Hebrew leaders there in Jerusalem tell him you need to go ahead and be a part of this and take part of this vow because there's all kinds of stories going that you're telling people they don't have to follow the law of Moses. And this will calm a lot of division in the church if you'll just do this. And Paul didn't think it was that big a deal because he did it. He shaved his head. He went and paid all their offerings. And, and, and he joined in. Then he got in the, the temple and he started talking and he, they were ready to kill him. But anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I don't fully understand the vow. But this is, this is kind of one of the interesting things to me tonight. In the book of James, chapter 5, verse 15, this is the only place this word, and it's only in the scriptures three times, and, and this is the only place it's translated prayer. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if, you, if he's committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. If this is a vow, it totally changes the dynamics of this verse. Yeah. Because if, if it's prayer, then it, the, the impetus of faith falls upon those that are praying. If any sick among you, let him call the elders of the church. And they'll anoint him with oil. Right. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. But if this is a vow, is any sick among you? Let him call the elders of the church and they'll anoint you with oil and a vow of faith. Not their vow. The one that's sick's vow. I vow to have faith in you, Lord. You see how it changes everything? Yeah, yeah. And it, like I said, it's only in the Scriptures one time, so we can't make that big a deal about it. But we have made that big a deal about it, haven't we? Uh -huh. I mean, we've, we've got entire movements that, that use this one verse of Scripture, and I've done it. I, thought, I just heard what they said, and I'm like, yeah, that's really cool. Let's do that. And I'm not saying we don't. I'm, saying, I'm not saying we stop doing that. Any sick among you, let him call the elders of the church. Let them anoint him with oil. But we're looking at somebody who's believing God. Think about that. I, because that's the word. I mean, you can try to ignore it all you want, but if you're really going to find out what things are saying, you've got to dig in the word. Right. Study to show yourself approved. Yes, sir. Amen? Amen? And if you're going to study, you've got to get in the words. Right. If you're going to get in the words, you've got to get in the definitions. And those are the definitions of what the words mean. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it's only in there one time, so I don't think we should try to make a mountain out of a molehill. But I think it should because it really speaks to me. It just absolutely resonates in my spirit. It goes, goes much deeper than just James 5 and 15. Because it's something that the Lord's been speaking to me over and over and over. I see it all the time, everywhere I go. Ever since Brother Brian came uh, and, and he, he preached that word, of what does it take to have great faith? You've got to get your eyes on Jesus. That's the only way to have great faith. Well, this goes perfectly with that. Right. Yeah. Yes. Your vow of faith is to get your eyes off yourself. Yes. This vow of faith is to have faith in God, right. not trust in what you can do. Yeah. See, it's, it's almost like the writer is saying, if you get sick enough that the doctors can't help you, if you get sick enough that Pepto-Bismol doesn't do the trick, if you get sick enough where ibuprofen doesn't do what's needed done, then if you ever get to a place where the only person that can help you out of this mess that you're in is God, then just lift your eyes to heaven and say, God, I ain't got nobody else. I'm not looking to anybody else. You're the only one that I'm trusting. All of my faith is in you. I have no hope in me. I have no hope in men. I have no hope in medicine, God. You're it for me, Lord. 
just won't be such a big deal anymore. Because he's bigger than sickness. Hallelujah. It's just sometimes we got our eyes on everything else until something comes along that the only one bigger than it is God. Who else are we going to look to right now? Ain't nobody else can stop Irma. Ain't nobody else can fix what Harvey did. I think maybe we should look to God. Yes, sir. I think we just get our eyes off everything else. Just look to God. That doesn't mean that he, he told us to do business till he returns. We got everybody has business. I'm not telling you to go sell everything you have and go up on a mountain and wait on God. That's not what I'm telling you to do. I'm just telling you to get your eyes off yourself for provision. Get your eyes off yourself for, for your strength. It's not a matter of am I a strong enough person to walk this thing out. No one in their right mind can read the words of Jesus and believe they have half a chance of walking this out in their own strength. I'm telling you, Paul's teachings are just so teeny, tiny, easy, Weenty little bitty tidbits compared to some of the things that Jesus said. Right, right. I mean, Jesus, he, man, he just, yes, he did. Yeah. man, I got to bless those that curse me. <laughs> no, that, see, there you are. Your eyes are on you. Right. Your eyes are on your situation. And your eyes are not on God. Yeah, so if we're looking at everything else, then we lose the focus of the only one that really matters. Yeah. That's why the angel said, when Joshua told him, he said, are you for me? Or are you, I mean, you, you for me? You against me? Neither one. Now take your shoes off, stupid, where you're standing is holy ground. Yeah. He didn't say stupid. I added that in. That's my translation. <laughs> it applies. Yes, See, when I look at me, I get discouraged. When I look at everything, when I look at my situations, when I look at the circumstance, when I look at the limitations, when I look at everything's wrong, all I do is get discouraged. Yeah. But when I look at God, when I look to God and I see who He says He is in the Scriptures, look unto the hills from whence cometh my help. He is a rock and a fortress. He is a safe refuge to anybody that wants to run into Him. Hallelujah! If I could just get my eyes off everything except Him, then I start, I start getting happy. They tell me that Donnie run around the church Sunday. Why did he do that? Because he was happy. Oh. He obviously got his eyes off himself. Oh. And see, I know folks say, well, I could never do that. As long as you're looking at you, you can't do that. But when you get your eyes off yourself, and all you can think about is him, when I think about the Lord and how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, Scripture. 
our praise as many ways as there are people. Yeah. We're all so different. We're not alike. We look different. We smell different. We think different. We act different. And, and I, you know, I, it's all right to disagree. Just stop being disagreeable. Yeah, come on. Wow, he's so good. He's so amazing. God is incredible. It's incredible all the things that he is able to do, all the the miracles and the, the healings, the lives that he is able to transform, and only he can do it. I know people that have tried so hard on their own to fix themselves, to fix situations, to, you know, oh, um, oh I'm going to turn over another, a new leaf or something crazy thought like that. We can't do it in ourselves. What the Bible says, in him we live and move and have our being. It's in Him we live. It's in Him we move. We're quickened. It's in Him we have our being. It's in Him. It's who we are. And in Him, there is nothing impossible. So I want to encourage you today, as we go to the Lord in prayer, get your eyes off your situation and get your eyes on God. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that with you, God, all things are possible. You are amazing, God. And Lord, I lift up everyone that is hurting today. God, I pray that you would just hold them close, that you would encourage and minister. God, there are so many people that are going through such horrific things. And Lord, you are the answer, God. Father, you said that while we're on this earth, God, there's going to be trials, there's going to be tribulations. But you said, be of good cheer, for you have overcome the world. And Lord, there is nothing, Father God, that you can't do. And I pray, Lord, for all those that are hurting, that you would just hold them close and comfort them, heal them, raise them up, God, as only you can. And Lord, we give you the glory for it all. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Remember, visit us on the website, lfwc.us. We'll see you next time. God bless you.